Great. So I look forward to this second session in the Net webinar series. Uh, the first topic for those who, who joined in September was Glass. Today, the subject will be WhoNet macros and quick analysis report. So these are WhoNet analysis features, uh, especially designed to make the life of the data manager, the analyst, easier and more efficient and more consistent. We'll cover the following topics today. First, I will have uh, just a few points to make about the previous webinar so that you know where you can find those materials, as well as the materials for today's session. Followed by a brief introduction to what is a WhoNet macro, what is a WhoNet report. Then we'll move to WhoNet data analysis. How do you create, use, then we will go to a larger scale to quick just a little bit. In Oh, I'm sorry, you're, you're cutting in and out just a little bit. Maybe um, try moving a little bit closer to the mic. Maybe it's cutting out. Sure. Uh, how is this? Is this better? That sounds good. OK, thank you very much. Um, in fact, I, I, I'm a bit close to the screen, so I will not turn on my camera right now, but I will turn on my camera later in the call. Um, right, so we'll talk about comments on the WhoNet webinar series, an introduction to WhoNet macros and reports, how do we create, use, edit, and backup macros? And then quick analysis. How can we combine these together to do many different kinds of analyses together? We'll see two kinds of reports, WhoNet standard reports that we have given to you, predefined fixed reports. These are available on the screen, Excel, and Word. You will also see how to make user-defined reports where you choose the analyses and the parameters and the organisms. At the present time, those are only available in screen in Excel, but in 2024, we will be making options so that you can also make user-defined Word reports. We'll have a brief conversation about uh, the WhoNet automation tool. The WhoNet automation tool will be the subject of an, an additional webinar in the future. So today, the, it will just introduce the idea of the automation tool. For example, uh, what you will learn about today is macros and reports and how you can run these when you want manually. You can run them once a week, once a month, once a year. But in my own hospital, we have everything automated. At one o'clock in the morning, the hospital lab system downloads us the data. And then at 1.15, Backlink will run to create a WhoNet file. At 1.30, WhoNet will generate a lot of reports automatically. So when the infection control people come in in the morning, they do not look at they do not need to look at WhoNet. They can look at the WhoNet analysis outputs in the form of Excel or Word documents. So very valuable, but that will be the subject of a future webinar. Finally, questions and answers. We will start with questions and answers on today's topic on today's webinar. But after that, of course, with time, I'd be happy to answer any other questions on other topics related to WhoNet and Backlink. So the WhoNet webinar series is something new that we started in September. The idea is maybe something like uh, once a month. Uh, we will refine that over time, depending on the needs and the interest. You can find the recordings, the slides, additional resources on the WhoNet website by simply going to whonet.org, on the main menu, clicking on webinars, or you can use the direct link that you see here. We uh, have already translated the previous webinar into 13, uh, actually that's now been increased. I think we're now up to 17 or 18 languages. Adam added a few more languages, which are now available through closed captions. And I will show you that. So now I'm gonna show you the WhoNet website. So I will stop sharing my PowerPoint. I'll go to the WhoNet website, whonet.org. And here at the top on the main menu, you see webinars. I will click on webinars. At the bottom of the slide, you see our previous webinar. At the top of the slide, you see the current webinar for today, including the registration link. So we will send out these emails, but if you are ever curious about the schedule, simply go to whonet.org and click on the webinars option. With regard to the September link, with regard to the September webinar, you will see this topic. The YouTube recording is here on the left. 
The PowerPoint slides are in the middle. There were two presentations, one by myself and one by Barb Tornimbene from WHO. And then additional resources about the WHO Glass website and protocol and manual. I will now click on webinar recording, click on YouTube. Hmm. Adam, if I understand correctly, you did not hear the audio, is that right? Right, okay, so I will continue. So here you see the Hunet. I'll just jump in a little bit to the actual webinar. So as you can see, I can maximize this and I have an advertisement. Four, three, two, one, I can skip ads. So as you can see, this is the webinar that we gave last time. And at the bottom, you see the closed captions in Vietnamese. Here at the bottom left, you see two icons. One of them says CC, that's closed captions. I can click them on, I can click them off. So that's how you choose whether or not to see the captions. That's icon number one. The second icon next to it is the configuration or the settings icon. If I click on that, I can change the language from Vietnamese to, for example, Indonesian. And now the text is in Indonesian. Or if I click to Chinese, the text is now in Chinese. And now we'll go back to English. So we're trying to make the documents as available and simple to you as possible. Personally, for myself, I often change the playback speed. You know, right now that is normal speed. I can go to 1.25, 1.5, twice the speed. When I'm listening to a two hour webinar, I will often increase the speed uh, just to go through the webinar more quickly. That's a useful feature. Uh, I will now stop sharing the YouTube video. I will close that screen and I will go back to the PowerPoints. I will also close my mailbox. I'm now back in the PowerPoint. You confirm that I'm now back correctly into the PowerPoint? Everything looks good, John. Thank you. So here you see the languages that we have included, uh, and if there's priority languages for you, um, we'd be happy to. Um, this, these are done with automatic translations, and automatic Google translations, automatic Amazon translations are very good, but they are not perfect. So of course you will find mistakes in the translations. However, uh, we can work with you to improve the quality of the translations, uh, but I hope that it is understandable. I will now go to the next slide. So here are some possible topics for future webinars. We are currently covering this one in bold, macros and quick analysis reports. <clears throat> in perhaps April or March or April, whenever it's ready, we'll have a webinar about HUNA 2024 and the new features. So that will be an annual webinar. We will also have webinars on analysis and reporting features. Perhaps in February, we will do the annual antibiograms. That is the time of year that people start to prepare their annual statistics. So either January or February, we plan to talk about annual antibiograms, the national hospital statistics, or the national or the annual national statistics. Many people ask us about who net features for outbreak detection. And our features for outbreak detection rely strongly <clears throat> on the HUNET analyses for multi-drug resistance. HUNET has an analysis called a scatter plot. HUNET has analysis for looking at multi-drug resistance called resistance profile. Uh, so that will be the topic of one webinar. As specialized webinars available, interesting for some of you, we will have something about DHIS2, the HUNET automation tool, the HUNET AST interpretation engine, and other topics that you see here. And you and I can collaborate together if you would like something customized for your country or your region or your language. And feel free to suggest ideas for future webinars. So now I'm moving to the main topic for today's webinar. Oh. Macros and reports. So very often, HUNET users wish to repeat the same set of analyses on a regular basis. I may spend a lot of time today to make some nice analyses for my laboratory or pharmacy or infection control staff today. But what happens if I want to repeat the exact same analyses one week from now 
or one month from now. I don't want to have to repeat everything from the beginning. I might not remember which organisms I selected. I might not remember which features and parameters I selected. So macros uh, are there to help you remember what your previous analyses looked like. You might wish to have different analyses for different audiences. Within a laboratory, within an institution or a hospital, you have laboratory staff, infectious disease staff, infection control, pharmacy. Or you may have national needs for national authorities, stakeholders, epidemiologists, national or international funders. So the a goal of macros is to make things more consistent and uh, faster. So the purpose of macros is to permit you to repeat analyses that you have done previously. The macros will remember the analysis type, organisms, isolate filters, the data files, and other analysis parameters that you have selected. When you use a macro, you can repeat the analyses on the exact same files, or you can choose new files before you begin the analysis. For example, I might create some macros for my January data, but I would also like to use those same macros in February and March and April, and you can do that. Or if I am the national data manager and I create some macros for hospital number one, I can use those same macros for hospitals two, three, four, five. I can use the same macros for the national analyses. A WhoNet macro does a single analysis, but macros can also be combined into larger analysis sets called WhoNet reports. So in this webinar, we will start with the macros, which do one analysis at a time, and then you will see how to combine them together into a WhoNet report. Macros and reports. They basically, macros and reports save you time and they promote consistency so that every month you have the same analyses with the same features. There's no need to remember all of the details about which organisms, which filters, which other options you selected. One WhoNet user can also create macros and reports for others. Might have somebody with more knowledge, more experience, more time to prepare the macros. And then he can show other people, that person can show other people how to utilize those macros on a weekly or a monthly basis. Those people can be inside of one institution or across many institutions. As I described earlier, the macros and reports can also be automated to run on a daily basis or a weekly basis or a monthly basis for your different audiences. So the first, first slide here is how do I run a HUNET analysis? This is not yet about macros. This is how do I simply run a HUNET analysis? So you start HUNET, you go to the data analysis routine, you choose the analysis features that you want, and then you can begin your analysis. Here as an example, I will show you in a few moments that I will choose the WHO test laboratory, choose the analysis percent RIS for Staph aureus and E. coli. I will choose the one month of sample data that we distribute with WHONET from to the, to the year 2000, January. And I will also choose the feature first isolate with antibiotic results. I will show you soon how to do that. After I do that, you will see my analysis selections here on the slide. And at the bottom of the slide, you see begin analysis. After I click on begin analysis, you will see the results of the analysis. I will now stop sharing the PowerPoint. or the Kenya one. I was doing a nice demonstration last week in Italy, two weeks ago in Italy, where we used the C-Lab system. The C-Lab is a, is a veterinary lab information system, and I was doing a demonstration for the One Health audience there. When you install WhoNet, you will see the second option here, the lab WHO test. That We make this available to everybody so that you can explore and practice with WhoNet, teach yourself WhoNet, before you have your own data. So for today's webinar, everything that I do, you will be able to do yourself later. So I will go to the WHO test laboratory. I will open the laboratory. 
Here at the top, I have some file features, data entry features, data analysis features, and help features, including the documentation. Everything I do today, almost everything I do today, will be available in documentation. And I can go to About to learn about HUNET. Before I continue with data analysis, I will go to Help and I will click on About. I discussed this on the first webinar, and here on the About screen, you get my personal email, you get the technical support email that we share in our, with our team, and some links from Deborah Chung. I want to point out two points here. First of all, I am using HUNET from October 5, 2023. So if you're ever wondering what version of HUNET you are using, you can go to the About screen and it will tell you you are using HUNET 2023, specifically the version from October 2023. That's one detail I want to highlight. The second detail is that this is the 64-bit HUNET. I'm going to come back to this later in the presentation. Later in the presentation, we will export from HUNET to Word. We will export from HUNET to Excel. And that usually works very well for most people. Sometimes there are compatibility issues. You might have a 64-bit version of HUNET, but maybe a 32-bit version of Office. So if your version of HUNET and your version of Office do not match, Sometimes there will be compatibility issues. Most of the time there will not be compatibility issues, but sometimes there will be. So we will discuss this later in the presentation. But since I am here on the About screen, I want to highlight for you, this is how you know what version of HUNET you have. You have HUNET from October 2023, the 64-bit version. I will show you later in the presentation, how do you know what version of Microsoft Office you have? That's also something we covered on the first in the first webinar. Now back on the main menu, here under data analysis, you see two options. Data analysis is for interactive data analysis where you choose the analysis uh, details. The second option is quick analysis. We'll come back to that later in today's webinar. Let me go to data analysis. And I'm at the HUNET analysis screen. Hopefully many of you, most of you are already familiar with the screen. If not, you can go back to our tutorials, our PDF documents. We will probably have webinars as similar on general analysis as well. So there are three required questions on the left. What kind of analysis do you want to do? Which organisms, which data files? With those three questions, you can then begin your analysis. So as I suggested on the PowerPoint, I will go to analysis type, and I want this first option, percent RIS and test measurements, the detailed report. There is also a summary report. I will click on OK. That's question one. Question two, organism. I am going to choose Staph aureus from the list on the left. The code is SAU. Options appear on the left of the screen. Actions appear on the right of the screen. You can use these arrow keys or you can hit enter a code and hit enter to move your, your uh, organisms that you want to study from the left to the right. I've selected these two organisms. I will click on OK. Then I go to data files. First one is our one month of sample data for human health isolates. The second one has 400 isolates that I use for One Health audiences. It has 100 human results, 100 animal, 100 food, and 100 environmental water samples. So for today's demonstration, I will choose the WHO test laboratory for January 2000 data. My options appear on the left using this arrow key or by using double click, I can move that to the right. I will click on OK. Those are my three core analysis details, and I can now click on Begin Analysis. However, I want to do one more thing. I want to go to this feature called One Per Patient. 
by patient, first isolate only, or first isolate with antibiotic results. So I will choose that feature. This will be discussed in our January or February webinar on antibiogram preparation. So for today, I will choose first isolate with antibiotic results. I click on OK, and I'm now ready to begin my analysis. I click on Begin Analysis. I wait, and here I see the result. I see the antibiotic listed here, human, animal. There are some dog breakpoints. There are breakpoints in some cases for meningitis, non-meningitis, skin, soft tissue, uncomplicated urinary tract infection. The number tested, percent R, percent I, percent S. Here it says 100% question mark. The question mark simply means that there are no breakpoints. This drug is vancomycin disc, and there are no breakpoints for CLSI. This is not considered to be a valid test. Therefore, HUNET says 100% question mark. I'd like to look here at the graph called number tested. I see that they test every drug systematically, consistently, except for nitroferentoin, which is a urine drug. So this analysis tells me a lot about their test practices. Are they testing antibiotics correctly? Are they testing them systematically? And then at the bottom, I can look at the zone diameter distributions. Penicillin, I see sensitive bacteria on the right, highly resistant bacteria to the far left. Those would typically be the MRSA, and then moderately resistant bacteria in the middle. With erythromycin, I can see sensitive, very resistant, moderately resistant. I can copy and paste to Excel or to Word or PowerPoint, or I can save the table. But this is not the subject of today's webinar, so I will click on continue. So that is, uh, that is the, those are the results for Staph aureus. These are now the same results for E. coli. I will click on continue. So that is how you run a normal HUNET analysis. I will now go back to my PowerPoint. Now that I have run an analysis, how do I create a macro? Well, you click on macros at the bottom of the screen. Then you click on new macro. You enter a name for the macro. For example, percent RIS, Staph aureus and E. coli, first isolate with the antibiotic results. And then I click save once. And then I click save again. I save the name of the macro and I also save the name of the macro file. For example, WhoNet will suggest percent RIS, Staph aureus, and E. coli first, first only. By default, your macros will go into the WhoNet macros folder. You can change that, but the default location is the macros will go together into the WhoNet folder in the macros subfolder. So what does this look like on the screen? Well, on the previous screen, in the lower left, you see macros. When you click on macros, you see this screen, including the option new. You save the name of the macro and you click on save. You then click on save again to save the macro file. And you can, and then you will have this after you click on save. On the left, you see that I have no macros. On the right, I have one new macro. So what does that look like in HUNET? I will now return to HUNET. Here in the lower left is the button for macros. I will click on macros. I did this yesterday. Let me delete that. Two. Percent RIS for Staph aureus and E. coli. Just give it a name that means something to you. It doesn't have to give all of the details, but just enough details so that you know what the purpose of the macro is. You can save everything, or maybe just the organism list, or very common for a national data manager, maybe just a list of data files. You may want to have one macro for the laboratories in the north of your country, a different university hospitals. So I will save everything, 
but you don't have to save everything. You just save the features that you are interested in. I'm clicking on save once to save the macro name. I now need to save the macro file name. Hunet is suggesting to give it the exact same name as the macro, but then to add in the letters MCR. I will now click on save a second time. And now I see this macro. Percent RIS for staph aureus and E. coli first isolate per patient with antibiotic results. So that is how I make a macro. I'm now going to exit out of the, the macro screen. We'll now go back to my PowerPoint. Now, how do I use the macro? So you saw how simple it is to create a macro. How can I use that macro for something useful? Well, you go back to data analysis, you click on macros, just like we did. But instead of clicking on new, you will click on load. Find the macro that you want and click on load. This will load the macro into the analysis screen, and then you are ready to begin the analysis. You can begin the analysis immediately, or you can refine the analysis, change the data files, change the organisms. So on the left is the screen that we just saw where I created a new macro. When I click on load, I will have this screen loading the macro details. And then when I click on begin analysis, I now have the output screen on the right. I will now go back to Hunet and show that. In fact, I will leave here. I can leave Hunet. I've left Hunet completely. And then I can come back a day later, a week later, a month later. I start Hunet again. I open the laboratory. I go to data analysis. I go to data analysis. And now I am ready to define a new analysis manually. Or much faster, I can go to macros. I see two macros in my example. I click on the first one and I load. When I click on load, was previously is now back again, including if I go to one per patient, it's by patient first isolate with antibiotic results. So that's the whole idea of a macro. You spend a lot of time the first time making the macro, and then to use the macro is extremely simple. I can now either begin the analysis immediately, or I can change the January data file to the February data file, or I can change the analysis from hospital one data to hospital five data, or I can add more organisms, or I can put some isolate filters. So the macro has recovered all of the details that I previously selected. If I'm happy with that, I click on begin analysis immediately, or I can make some changes before I click on begin analysis, which I will do right now. Begin analysis. I see the RIS results for Staph aureus. Continue. I now see the RIS analysis results for E. coli. I will click on continue. So that is how you use a macro. I will now go back to the PowerPoint. Most people create their macros, use their macros, and they don't need to edit the macro. The macro is fine. You don't need to change the macro. Hunet does all of that for you. However, there can be advantages to editing a macro manually. So how do I edit the macro manually? For example, maybe I want to put another organism, or maybe I want to change the data files, or maybe I made a spelling mistake in the name of the macro, and I simply want to save the correction to the macro name. I go to Hunet Data Analysis, I click on Macros, uh, you see the list of macros, choose the one that you want. Then do not click on new, do not click on load, you click on edit. Hunet will then show you the parameters that are defined in the macro. If you want to make changes, click on edit again, make the changes, and then save and exit. You can also use window if you want to rename the macro. So here is the macro screen. We discussed new, we discussed load, you can also delete, but this time I will click on edit. And this is what a macro looks like. 
many of you, I hope, are familiar with macros, but many of you probably have not looked to see what a macro looks like. And a macro is very simple. It has the name of the macro at the top, which laboratory, which antibiotics, one per patient, which organism, Staph aureus and E. coli, and which data files. So how can I edit that? Back to the macro screen. We've done new already. We have done load already. I already did delete to get rid of something. But here I want to choose the macro that's interesting for me, and I click on edit. And here, I can see all those analysis details. But maybe I want to make a change. I change immediately. I have to click on edit first. Edit. For example, maybe I don't want two organisms. Maybe I also want Klebsiella pneumonia and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So then I just added those to the list of organisms. Macro. Steph aureus, E. coli. Bonus. I can click on save. Leave the screen. I go back into the screen, and now you can see the name of the macro has been updated. So I added more organisms, I changed the name of the macro, and now if I click on load, it now gives me all four organisms. So if you get more and more familiar with macros, it's just nice to learn that you can edit them manually if you would like. There is one small problem with this macro that I just edited. At the top, you see the name of the macro. The name of the macro, I didn't change. The name of the macro is still RIS, Staphorus, and E. coli. If you want to change the name of the macro, I cannot do it here, uh, but I can go to Windows and I can change the name of the file. I will click on Exit. Now we'll return to the PowerPoint. That is how I can edit the macro using Hunet. I just use the edit button. But I can also use a text editor such as Notepad, WordPad, Notepad Plus. There are many softwares I can use to edit files. So macros are simple text files and can be edited with any text editor such as Notepad. By default, Hunet macros are saved in the Hunet macros. Find the macro that you wish to edit. And then usually you can double click on it or open notepad. You can edit this file or you can make a copy before you edit it. So I have one macro that we created together for Staph aureus and E. coli. Instead of editing that macro, maybe I should make a copy and then I can edit the copy. So here on the left, you see Windows File Explorer. So let me do that. I'm now going to Go to Hunet. I'm going to go to my desktop and I simply go to the Windows File Explorer. On the left side, I will go to the C drive. I will choose my Hunet folder. It's a folder called Macros. So go to my Macros folder and it shows me all of the macros that I have defined previously. Later today, you will learn about report files. The report files will also be saved here. So here you see RIS for Staph aureus and E. coli first. Well, one thing I might want to do is I might want to rename that. Uh, and I can say, well, it's Staph aureus and E. coli and Klebsiella pneumonia and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. That way the name of the file agrees with the name of the macro. So I can also make a copy. I now have a copy. And let me say, for example, um, I'll just put here um, all salmonella. I'm putting that in capital letters. All capital letters means that it's all of the different salmonella serotypes. Analyses. Lowercase means a specific species. Uppercase means a whole group of many bacteria, usually related bacteria. So I have created a new macro, but I haven't edited it yet. Small mistake. That should not be a period. That should be a comma. Double click and Notepad now opens. And I don't want just these organisms. I also want to include Salmonella in the list of organism names. 
and I also want it included in the macro name. Cell, and I can now click on File, Save, and that's been saved. I can also change the name of the data files. I can change some of these other parameters. I can copy and paste in between macros. I'm going to do File, Exit. I have my nice new macro, now in alphabetical order. Those explore. Now back in Hunet, I'm going to go to macros, and here you see the new macro, including the Salmonella. I can see the Salmonella if I click on edit, and here you see Salmonella is now at the end of the list, or I can click on load like we did earlier, load, and you see Salmonella is here inside of Hunet. So you can use Hunet to edit your macros, or you can use Notepad or other text editor to edit your macro. Now, when I click on Begin Analysis, it shows me the Staph aureus, continue. E. coli, continue. Capsiella, continue. Pseudomonas, continue. And it, this file did not have any Salmonella in it. Therefore, it did not show me that. Well, therefore, it says no Salmonella results have been found. I'm going to click on OK. Let me begin the analysis again to show you a small nice feature begin analysis that's organism number one continue organism number two continue organism number three what happens if i want to immediately cancel this analysis i don't have to do continue 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 until i get to the end i can click on file in the upper left hand menu and i can click on stop analysis stop analysis stops the analysis immediately so you don't have to click continue 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 now go back to the PowerPoint. How to share or backup macros for yourself or with other people. So as you've seen, the folders, the files are in the macros folder. You can make backup copies or send copies to your colleagues by email. Um, you don't want to send your data files to other people if there's confidential information, unless you have an agreement that you can share confidential information for your HUNET data files. HUNET macros don't have confidential data. As you saw, the macro is very small. It has the list of the organisms, the list of data files. That information is not usually confidential. Um, it, I've never seen this example, but if you have a macro specifically for you know, Mary Jones, that might be confidential, but I just don't see people putting Mary Jones into the name of a macro. And even if they did, it would not include Mary Jones results. It would just have the name of the patient. So generally speaking, macros have no confidential information in them. So generally you can share your macros without worrying about confidentiality issues, which is different from data files. When you're dealing with data files, just make sure that you have a good relationship and an understanding uh, with the other group. In the United States, we often usually need also a legal agreement. So how to share or back up a Hunet macro? Let me go back to Windows Explorer. I go back to Hunet. I go back to Macros. And I, I can make a copy here, but if I make a copy here, that's not a very good backup. I can take, I can take any individual file, or I can take the full Macros folder. I can copy the Macros folder and put it onto the network drive, the D drive, the F drive, the P drive or onto a memory stick, or onto a CD, so that you have a permanent storage of your macros, or your data, or the other information that you want to have backups of. Email, let me go to my own email. I'm gonna say new message. And I can go to attach, browse this PC. I enter my five Hunet macros folder. And then I can send him one or two, three macros. I click on send, and now he has my macros files. Okay, I will now go back to the PowerPoint. Now we're going to a quick analysis, which I, th which, which I think 
uh, we're very proud of it. We've done a lot and people, we've gotten very good feedback value of these quick analysis features. Also look at the time, it is quarter to eight for me, so we are doing well with time. So we'll talk about quick analysis features. We'll spend a lot of time on WhoNet standard reports. We have two kinds of reports. We have reports that were developed for the screen and for Microsoft Excel. We have another kind of report for Microsoft Word. These are WhoNet standard reports where we decided here in Boston on what the content should be. The, the text, the details, the organisms, we decided that. These are fixed reports for Excel, Screen, and Word, which is great, which is valuable, but it's also good if you can make your own reports so that you decide which organisms, which filters, which wards, which parts of the country, which laboratories. So you will see user-defined reports. Right now, you can make user-defined reports to the screen or to Excel. We have not yet made user-defined reports for Word. That is a priority for new development. At the beginning, we'll make it a little bit configurable and then a little more configurable and then a little bit more configurable because we would like you to be able to choose the logo, the text, you know, some decisions as to which organisms, which thresholds. So that will be a new feature we will begin, you know, uh, in 2024 or before. Uh, I will very briefly mention DHIS2. Uh, DHIS2 is a very widely used public health surveillance platform. People have used it for many years for HIV, TB, malaria, now for COVID, vaccinations, adverse reactions, ventilators, oxygen. Um, DHS2 is also used for antenatal care, vaccines, diabetes management. Um, so it's a very widely used public health surveillance platform, especially in Africa and South Asia, Southeast Asia. Uh, it is now also the basis of the new WHO Glass platform, as we mentioned on the last webinar. So if you start submitting data to WHO Glass that is using DHIS2 technology. It originated in South Africa. The project is now managed since many years by the University of Oslo in Norway. We will, that will be the subject of a different webinar, so I will not have a lot to say about DHIS2 today. So who needs standard reports and user-defined reports? So here you see the quick analysis screen, and here you see a menu with three options. You see the WhoNet standard reports, user-defined reports, and the DHIS2 reports. And then here you see the reports one to nine. Adam, small thing, it says nine, it should say number eight. Um, the number, <clears throat> number one is the WhoNet standard report. I personally wrote, my, wrote that myself over 20 years ago. So the first one called WhoNet standard report, we will be removing because the other ones have more complete content and better formatting. We have these that were developed to be seen on the screen and Excel. Patient and sample statistics, organism and antibiotic statistics, ICID alerts. These were developed by, for Microsoft Word, epidemiology report, test practices and quality report, an FAO report, which is in development, focusing on animal species. And then finally, is a report called AMAS. That's not a report that we developed here in Boston. That's a report developed by the Oxford Research Network in Southeast Asia. There's Moru in Thailand, Kamru in Cambodia, Okru in Vietnam, Lamru in Laos, and they have collaborated on the AMAS project. And so this is a, a file, this is a software report that we've integrated into WhoNet. So you can use WhoNet to make AMAS reports. Of course, I will focus on Today, I think I will focus on report number three, report number five, and report number six. But you may want to explore these other reports as well. So this is what I mean by report to the screen. So one report to the screen for the organisms is gives you many results. Organism by date, organism by location, by location type, by specimen type percent resistance for E. coli, percent resistance for staph, uh, gram-negative antibiogram, gram-positive antibiogram. And here I have selected analyses to show you on the screen. 
organism by location. And on the left, you see that the, the, these are quite small, but for E. coli, the two most common locations are outpatient on the right and emergency room on the left. You'll be able to read that later when I show this to you inside of WhoNet. And here on the right, you see the percent R, I, S for E. coli. You see for ampicillin, the sensitive bacteria are on the right, the very resistant bacteria are on the left, and the moderately resistant bacteria are in the middle. These are output to the screen. These are the exact same results, but output to Excel. Cardiology, cardiac surgery, emergency room, percent resistant, percent intermediate, percent susceptible. So these, these reports were designed for the screen and for Excel. These reports for epidemiology and quality were designed for Microsoft Word. There's a cover page with a logo for epidemiology and data quality. There's the distribution of age groups for male and female, distribution of different specimen types, the WHO priority list of antibiotic resistance, WHONET's multi-drug resistance profile analysis, cluster detection, diagrams. Don't worry that you cannot read it on this slide. We'll go through it more slowly and more completely with the Word document itself. So the Word document is attractive. It's not everything, it's just the highlights. And this is a very simple document to share with your colleagues and to print out. So what are the advantages of using the screen in Excel? You get a large volume of information, all organisms, all locations. For the screen displays, the interface is interactive. I want to see the graph for E. coli. I want to see the graph for ampicillin. Also create your own user-defined reports for the screen and Excel. Disadvantages, there's no explanatory text. It's a lot of graphs, it's a lot of tables. So you have to know what you're looking for. You have to know what it means. You have to know where to find it. And you cannot print that out. It would be too many pages. It would be hard to read. So then we also have the word report advantages. We don't show you all organisms, we show you the top 10. So it focuses on the highest priority results. It can be printed and shared, customized for the different audiences like microbiology, uh, pharmacy, et cetera. Disadvantages, well, it's right now, you can only do these for reports that we give to you. So the report is rigid. You cannot change the word reports. We are now working closely with the Fleming Fund country grant recipient in Papua New Guinea to make a word report specifically for Papua New Guinea with their content, with their logo, with their preferences. Um, so we're doing that as custom programming, um, but eventually, as you can see for future versions, we will allow you to eventually customize many elements in the report. We also want to start automating some highlights and recommendations. For example, highlight, you have a lot of vancomycin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. It is probably a mistake. Please recheck your methods. And that kind of recommendation we can automate without a manual review of the data. So quick analysis, how do you run a quick analysis? Oh, sorry, how do you make, oh no, I won't go to that. I have spoken about the quick analysis standard reports. So now I will go to WhoNet and I will show you how to use quick analysis. You begin WhoNet just like always. You choose open laboratory. I go to data analysis and I now click on quick analysis. Here you see those three options, the WhoNet standard report, user defined report, which is currently empty, Right now, I will stay with the WHONET standard reports. Number one will disappear, so I will not discuss it further. Number two, patient and sample details, age, gender, location, organism and antibiotic results, public health reporting, clinical alerts, and quality alerts. Five is the epidemiology report. Six is the quality report. Seven is the FAO report. And the last one is the AMASH report. So today I will focus on numbers three, five, and six. Uh, choose number three. I want to go to data files. 
happen to choose that one month of sample data. But I can choose one file, I can choose many files. You know, here I can do the same thing with all of my files. So you get to choose which files you want to include in the report. But for today's demonstration, I will only use the one month of human health data. I click on OK. I can output this. I really just have two choices to the screen or to Excel. So I'm going to click on begin analysis. This is a multi part analysis. This is part one. This analysis is organism in the rows and the laboratory in the columns. If I had five laboratories, I would see one column for each laboratory. So here in the table, as I said, it's interactive. If I click on number of isolates once, the table is now sorted. I click again, it's now sorted. So the most common organism is Staphylococcus coagulase negative, which is frequently a contaminant. E. coli staph, so this immediately allows me to see my five most common organisms. Staph, Citrobacter, they are all from laboratory TST because I'm only showing you data from one laboratory. E. coli, they're all from laboratory TST. That's in the top right for the graphs. Bottom right, I can show you the distribution of organisms for laboratory TST. And here you can see the graph and you see there are four organisms that are the most common. I will go from left to right. ENT, this is Enterococcus. ECO is E. coli. SEN is Staphylococcus coagulase negative. So that agrees with these top four in the table. So this is organism by laboratory. And I only have a single laboratory here, but if you're a national data manager with 20 laboratories, obviously it allows you to do a separate result for the different It's analysis one, continue. This is now organism by date. So I see the graph for E. coli and all of the data are for January. Haemophilus, Klebsiella. This is not so interesting because when we distribute HUNET, we give you one month of sample data. So this analysis is not so interesting because I have a full year of data. Of course, this analysis will be very useful for outbreak detection, looking for trends, looking to see if there are any months missing. Of course, during COVID, there was a very sudden drop throughout the world in approximately April of 2020 as microbiology laboratories were closing or all testing moved over to, micro, to, to virology. So you saw organism by laboratory. This is now organism by collection date, specifically by month. Continue. This is now organism by gender, male, female. So among females, the most common organism is E. coli. Among males, the most common two organisms, the most common three organisms are gram positives. That reflects a difference in the epidemiology. Women will have many urinary tract infections, so it's normal to have a lot more gram negatives with the women, especially E. coli. I can look at the graph for women, females, and you can see E. coli is by far more common than the other organisms. But for males, E. coli is much, much less. The other organisms, Enterococcus, Staph aureus, Staph coagulase negative, there does not seem to be a big difference between the male and the female. But E. coli, there's a very big difference. That's by gender. I will now click on continue. This is by age distribution. For example, with E. coli, you see in children, newborns, adults, the distribution. You will often see some organisms like Acinetobacter baumani in the older population because these are often hospital infections or nursing home infections. I can look at the distribution, for example, in this age group, the most common organism is Staphylococcus coagulase negative. So that's organism by age group. Continue. This is the organism by location. So, for example, for E. coli, you see that ER on the left is very common, emergency room, and OP, outpatient, is very common on the right. On the other hand, if I look for Haemophilus influenza, it's mostly outpatient. If I look for Staph aureus, 
similar. All of these are similar. There's one organism here that I found to be interesting. I'm going to go down to Stenotrompha monis multifilia. This organism exists in cardiology, intensive care unit, number one, infectious disease and outpatient, but it is much more common in the surgical intensive care unit. So Stenotrompha monis multifilia is an organism commonly associated with hospital infections. And in this hospital, it is especially concentrated in this one ICU surgical location. So of course, this is going to reflect the epidemiology. Some organisms like Haemophilus are mostly community. Some organisms like Stenotrophomonas are mostly hospital. I'm showing you the graph for Stenotrophomonas. I can now show you the graph for the surgical intensive care unit. And for all of the different species in the surgical Number one organism, surprisingly, is Stenotrophomonas multifilia. So this is interactive. So that is an advantage of the screen display where there, you might find things that are unexpected. And unusual things. You might notice that the code for Stenotrophomonas multifilia is. But why is the code for Stenotrophomonas multifilia PMA? The reason for that is very simple. Is 30 years ago, this organism was known as Pseudomonas multifilia, so we gave it the code PMA. Then the organism name changed from, from Pseudomonas multifilia to Xanthomonas multifilia. And then it changed again to Stenotrophomonas multifilia, but we never changed the code just to facilitate comparisons over time. The code will always be PMA, even if they change the code again. Also, while I'm here, I can do copy table, copy graph, save table, save graph. Uh, I can show you a small feature here. I can click on, I can right click on the graph, or I can click on file, graph options, and I can say this is surgical intensive unit January 2000. Okay. So there are small changes that you can make directly here on the screen. I'm going to click on continue. This is organism by location. This is now organism by location type. So instead of saying surgery, obstetrics, uh, surgical ICU, newborns, we've just simplified it to categories. Emergency room, ICU, inpatient and outpatient. Infection control people usually want to know the precise room, so location for them is more interesting. On the other hand, the pharmacy people, the pharmacy people care a little bit about that, especially if it's an ICU, but more generally speaking, they care more about inpatient versus outpatient. So pharmacy usually has more of an interest in, um, in location type than exact location. This is also true in the veterinary sector. The location type might be farm or restaurant or veterinary clinic. So you can group together your different types of location. I will click on continue again. And now you see here the different specimen types. So for example, E. coli, not a surprise. E. coli is by far most common in urine. If I go to Haemophilus, sputum, aureus, Going from left to right, blood, sputum, urine, and wound are the most common. Staphylococcus coagulase negative, often a contaminant, especially is common in blood. Or I can choose specifically blood, and blood is mostly coagulase negative staph. Urine is mostly E. coli and, and enterococcus. That's Dinotrophomonas multifilia. mostly sputum and wound. I will continue. So that was the end of the details for the organisms. Now we are doing the details for the antibiotics. So here I can see the antibiotics at the top, the percent R, I. I discussed this briefly earlier today. I see the human breakpoints, dog breakpoints, vancomycin, question mark. This is not a valid test. There were breakpoints 40 years ago. There are no longer breakpoints because it's not considered to be a reliable, reproducible test. So, who has R, I, S, 
and question mark, as uh, there are some other categories as well. When I look at this analysis, the first thing I like to do is I like to look at this graph because I'd like to see what antibiotics are they testing? Are they valid or invalid? Do they have breakpoints or do they not have breakpoints? That's question one. And question two, do, does every drug always get tested? Or are there urine drugs or first line drugs or second line drugs? Or maybe in the middle of the year, they switch from cefotaxime to ceftriaxone. So I want to look at their test practices. And you've already seen earlier, cefoxidin is either sensitive to the right or highly resistant to the left. Those would be your MRSA. I'm going to click on continue. And here at the top, I didn't point this out. Here at the top, it says Staphylococcus aureus, 86 isolates. Continue. This is now the same thing for E. coli with 86 isolates. Again, I go to number tested. And here you see there's more variation. The reason for this is because for E. coli, they do have certain drugs that are always tested, but then there are drugs like nitrofurantoin on the right, norfloxacin, that they only test in urine. In addition, they rarely test amicacin and tobramycin and ceftazidine. I'm gonna show this in the table by sorting the table. Here you see these antibiotics were tested 85 times. These antibiotics were always tested. These antibiotics were only tested in the urine isolates. These antibiotics were tested as second line drugs in the multi-resistant organisms, which of course can introduce a bias. So there are two graphs for ampicillin with different breakpoints. Let me show that in the graph, I'm sorry, in the table, where's my ampicillin? So here you see ampicillin with the human breakpoints, and here you see ampicillin with the cat breakpoints. So as you can see, for humans and animals, we agree where the sensitive range starts. At 17 millimeters is sensitive for a human, 17, centim 17 millimeters is sensitive for a cat. But on the other hand, on the human, 13 would be considered resistant. I'm in the wrong graph. On a human, 12 would be considered resistant for a human isolate, but intermediate if it is a cat isolate based on pharmacogenetics, pharmacodynamics, and other outcome studies. Now click on continue. This is now the gram-positive antibiogram. I'm gonna click on continue and go directly to the gram-negative antibiogram. I'm gonna sort this, and the most common organism is E. coli, followed by Pseudomonas. I can look at the graph for E. coli, and you see E. coli in this old database is a very sensitive organism. On the other hand, if I look for Pseudomonas, there is very little susceptibility to chloramphenicol and cotramoxazole. I can also look at a specific drug like ampicillin. These drugs have reasonable susceptibility to ampicillin. The others have intrinsic resistance. Here, for example, you see APA, Acinetobacter baumani, Citrobacter freundii, Enterobacter cloacae, um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Klebsiella oxytoca, Serratia marcescens on the right. These organisms have intrinsic resistance and therefore very little resist, very little susceptibility to ampicillin. And continue. So what have I just done? I clicked on organism. Oh, very simple. I clicked on organism and antibiotics, report number three. I chose a data file and then I began the analysis. I talked a lot about the analyses to take advantage of our opportunity together, but you can see how easy it was to get a lot of information with very little work. I'm gonna click on begin analysis again, just to reemphasize what we just did. Begin analysis. This is organism by lab. Month. Age group. Organism by location. Organism by location type. Organism by specimen type, and that's the end of the organism statistics. Detailed report for Staph aureus, RIS. Detailed report by gram positive antibiogram, gram negative antibiogram. I will now choose Microsoft Excel. Begin analysis. If you look in the lower left, 
You can now see HUNET is doing organism by lab, by month, the sex, and age group, location, location type, specimen type, detailed results for Staph aureus, detailed results for E. coli, gram-positive antibiogram, and gram-negative antibiogram, and it's now finished. It is saving all of the results to an Excel file. Do you want to review the Excel file? Yes, I do. It's open, but I can't see it, which is unfortunate. Here at the bottom of my screen, you can see that Excel is open. So I have to click on the Excel icon. And now you can see here's the full Excel file. You can see the table. You can see the graphs. This is by the number one, sheet number one is by lab. Month, organism by uh, gender, it tells you at the top which macro it is. Organism by sex, the next one down, whoops, the male-female graph. This one is by age group. This one is by location, location type, specimen type. The tables look the same because uh, the, the difference is off on the right. So here you can see the different specimen types on the right. And you can see the graphs are different. The graphs are down below. And now I see my detailed report for Staph aureus. I see my detailed result for E. coli, including my graphs. I can see my gram-positive antibiogram, and I can see my gram-negative antibiogram. This Excel sheet, this Excel file has 11 sheets in it. I'm going to click on exit. Do you want to save the changes? No, I do not. And I am now back in Hunet. So I hope you have a better idea about these kinds of reports. And you can make your own reports using user defined. That's what I wanted to show for number three. Quick analysis reports designed for the screen and for Excel. I'm now going to continue with number five epidemiology reports. And this, as you can see, goes directly to Word. You can see HUNET is automatically suggesting a name. It's going to say, let's call this the epidemiology report, and then it gives today's date. And it's automatically going to go to the HUNET. So you can put the files wherever you want. I can click on browse and choose a network drive or a memory stick or something else. But by default, HUNET will save everything to the HUNET folder, the output subfolder. I'm going to click on begin analysis. And look at the lower left, HUNET is doing a lot of analyses very quickly. Some analyses are faster, some analyses are slower. It is now doing the glass analyses. It has now finished all of the analyses. Now it is making the Word document, patient and sample statistics, organism statistics. While that is continuing, I do want to mention that for some of you, when it tries to make the Excel file or it tries to make the Word file, some of you will probably receive an error message. Or you might not get an error message, but the file will not be created or it won't be completely created. And that's because of some of these compatibility issues that I mentioned. If you are using a 32-bit version of Office, but a 64-bit version of HUNET, then you potentially might get these error messages. We do have guidance. We can often fix it. We cannot always fix it because you know we do not have control over Windows. We do not have control over Office. But I do suspect that for the large majority of you, there will not be a problem. If you do have a problem, if you do have any errors, just write to us and we can provide you guidance um, on what to do next. First of all, make sure that you have 32-bit HUNET and 32-bit Office or 64-bit HUNET with 64-bit Office, but there are other things that you can also do. Okay. So the analysis did finish. Do you want to open the file now? Yes, I do. I say yes. The file is now open, but unfortunately I cannot see it. So I have to go find it and there it is. 
I click on the word icon at the bottom of the screen. So first of all, I'm going to zoom out. So as you can see, there's a lot of detail and graphs and text in this document. So you have seen at the lower left of my screen, it says page 13 of 17. This is a 17 page document with a variety of different outputs. I'm now going to zoom in so you can actually read it. So this is today created. There's a table of contents, data volume, patient and sample details, organism de details, antibiotic details. Number five, reporting to WHO and the UN Sustainable Development Goals and cluster detection followed by antibiotic grants. So I'll just go from top to bottom. And I'm not gonna focus on the text, but the text describes what you were looking for educational, uh, useful for sharing with your colleagues. I'm only going to focus on the figures and the graphs and the tables. So here, for example, in table one, you see that there's only a single laboratory. If you have five labs, there will be one row for each lab. So laboratory one, there were 622 isolates from 277 people, meaning on average, there were 2.2 results per person. All of them happened in the year 2000. I can see the graph. There were 622 isolates, as you can see in the table, and all of them were in the month of January. Because I only have here one month of data. This is useful if you want to find if there are any time periods missing, and I do find sometimes July is missing, April is missing, or August is too small. So this is also helpful from a quality perspective. The database was 47% male, 53% female. Often I see a much bigger difference in many databases. There's a much larger number of female isolates, especially because of the urinary tract infections. That's one reason. A second reason is that generally speaking, women are often better about going to see physicians. They have a family doctor, an obstetrician, a pediatrician. So women are often better connected to the health system. The third reason that in many countries women have more samples is because in many countries women live longer. However, this does depend on the country and the local, you know, local uh, epidemiology of healthcare seeking practices. You can see the median age, you can see the age distribution for males on the left, females on the right. Table two is the distribution by exact location, and I'm not showing all of the location, but the top 10. The number one location was outpatient, representing only 20, almost 20% 20 of the isolates. There were 124 isolates from 99 different people because some of the people had more than one result. Oncology, there were 68 isolates from 49 people. So there are 1.4 isolates per person. In other words, there are in oncology, there are more repeat isolates. So I'd like to look at the last column to get an idea about repeats. For example, oncology often has more repeats. University hospital has more repeat results. Stenotrophomonas in burn patients often have more repeat results. Table three is not about location, but location type, where we have simplified this into inpatient, outpatient emergency. So even though the, lo the outpatient location is 20% of the database, if you add all of the inpatient locations together, that comes to over half, about 53%. We treat ICU separately. That's also, of course, an inpatient, but there's a lot of special interest, of course, in ICU. We now have the distribution by specimen category. The most common uh, result in this database is from urine, followed by respiratory, soft tissue and body fluids, blood, and other. Well, four, I will skip that, not so interesting. Table five, I'm not going to go through every detail, just highlighting some of the more interesting ones. Table five are the top 10 organisms, and we were looking that together on the screen display earlier. Table six is interesting. WHONET has a number of alerts. The three most important kinds of alerts are important species, important resistance, and quality control alert. So here you can see the list of important species. Only one of them was considered to be high priority, and that's Neisseria meningitis. Neisseria meningitis. Later, we will see uh, the resistance alerts 
And in the other report, we will see the quality alerts. In urine, the most common organism was E. coli, followed by Enterococcus. Staph, coagulase negative staph was almost half of the bloods. Respiratory was mostly um, Staph aureus, Haemophilus, Moraxella. Body, soft tissue was mostly staph and more staph. Organism trends. Uh, table seven are organisms that appear to be going up. Table eight are organisms that appear to be going down, but I cannot do this with one month of data. You do need at least several months of data to do this analysis. I can show you an example. I'm just looking at a bit at the time, but if you have, for example, one year of data, table seven will be organisms that look like they go up. Table eight will look like organisms that seem to be decreasing to help you define possible outbreaks or other problems. Antibiotic statistics. So you saw above the important isolates, the important species, now you see the important resistance. And there are three high priority alerts. The first would be Entobacteriaceae, Entobacterialides, non-susceptible to carbapenems. Staph, non-susceptible to vancomycin, there was one of those, but it's usually a mistake. Many laboratories find vancomycin resistant Staph aureus. In almost all cases, it's a mistake or beta hemolytic streptococcus, non-susceptible to penicillin. Again, that would often be a mistake. Monet then has two different ways for looking for multi-drug resistance. One is based on the number of categories or, sub, or classes of resistance or subclasses. How many classes is it resistance to? That's the ECP approach. And then there is the Hunet approach where we look at exactly which drugs are involved. Uh, so there was a 2012 publication. I am a co-author of this publication proposing definitions for MDR, XDR, and PDR. That's multi-drug resistance, extensive drug resistance, and pan-drug resistance. Um, let's see. Uh, there is a list of tables and recommendations for Staph aureus. Well, I'll come back to that in a moment. So Enterococcus faecalis there were to be no MDR, XDR, PDR with the data. For Staph aureus, 15% were considered to be multi-drug resistant. And by the table definition in the ECDC document, it has to be resistant to three or more classes or subclasses of drugs. And then we have possible PDR and poss possible XDR, possible PDR. The reason we call it possible, so PDR, means pan-drug resistant, resistant to everything tested. Specifically, everything tested listed in table one of the ECDC document. That table includes daptomycin, linezolid, vancomycin, tycoplanin. There's a large number of antibiotics that many laboratories do not test. So PDR means it's resistant to everything in the 2012 publication. Possible PDR means it's resistant to everything that this laboratory tested. It doesn't mean it's resistant to everything. It just means it's resistant to everything that you tested. So there were five isolates that were tested. It might be true, it might be a mistake. So this is looking at resistance from the perspective of how many classes or subclasses are resistant. This I find is very valuable, for example, for advocacy. You know, we have a lot of multi-drug resistance, pan-drug resistance, extensive drug resistance. We need new drugs. We need to make resistance a priority. We need to dedicate more funds to antimicrobial stewardship. So MDR, XDR, PDR is especially valuable from my perspective, from, um, you know, from an advocacy perspective. There's also a new C ECDC project to look at, multi at, at pan drug resistance. Anything which is resistant to everything tested should be reported to national authorities. And there, it's a pilot project right now. There's now the HUNET approach to multi-drug resistance, which is, I think, is especially valuable for infection control staff. So here for staff aureus, we have decided, or you can decide, which are the most interesting antibiotics to study. And by interesting, the thing I'm mostly interested is in drugs that are usually tested. Uh, for example, for staph aureus, I'm not interested in nitrofurantoin because you saw earlier that they don't usually test it. So here you see in gray, the seven antibiotics that they usually test that I was interested in. 
and all 86 of the Staph aureus were tested against all 86 of these isolates. I'm sorry, all 86 of these Staph aureus isolates were tested against these seven drugs. So we are going to use these seven drugs to classify the bacteria, and that's what you see in table 11. The most common Staph aureus was resistant to penicillin alone. These are normal Staph aureus that have existed for 50, 60, 70 years. Followed by Staph aureus resistant to two drugs, penicillin and erythromycin. Followed by Staph aureus susceptible to everything, including penicillin. And these were the wild type Staph aureus from 100 years ago. So uh, 100 years ago, most Staphylococcus aureus would have been of this type. But today, in this database, most of the Staph aureus are resistant to at least penicillin. Here we have resistant to three drugs, resistant to one drug, resistant to two drugs, resistant to seven drugs. So these are the bad ones. These are multi-drug resistant. They're very resistant. They are resistant to seven drugs, and that was four isolates from four people. You see Fox here. Fox represents the foxitin. Therefore, these are also MRSA. MRSA is considered to be resistant by the, fox, the suffoxetin disc or the oxacillin disc. Or I'm sorry, the suffoxetin disc or the oxacillin MIC. These are MRSA. These are also MRSA. Not all MRSA are the same. Uh, MRSA are resistant to penicillin and oxacillin by definition. Staph aureus might be resistant to other drugs. So here we see Staph aureus resistant to five drugs, penicillin, erythromycin, clindamycin, suffoxetin, and cipro. But those isolates are susceptible to gentamicin and ciprofloxacin. So here we are looking for multi-drug resistance in a very detailed way. And we find that very valuable for outbreak detection. That will be the subject of another webinar. This is the same thing for E. coli. And here you see resistant only to ampicillin. Here you see resistant to three drugs. For example, this is possibly an ESBL producer, cephalotaxime resistance. This one to me looks like a laboratory mistake. It seems to be cep cephalotaxime resistant, but ampicillin susceptible. And that does not really make sense. So you are looking, I always look at this from two perspectives. The epidemiology perspective, assuming it's true, but also the quality perspective. Do I see anything here that looks strange? And it is strange to have an E. coli that is resistant to cephalotaxime, but susceptible to ampicillin. So those are two different ways to look at multi-drug resistance, and that will be the subject of a future webinar. Here we have reporting to WHO or the UN, or for yourself, you do not have to report. Here you see there is a WHO global priority list of antibiotic resistant bacteria, especially for the development of new drugs. You see that there are ones of critical priority, high priority, and medium priority. And in this database, there was nothing resistant. There were no carbapenem resistant E. coli. There were no um, vancomycin resistant Enterococcus faecium. Um, but there were 11% MRSA. followed by WHO GLASS, which covers those four organisms and those eight pathogens, according to GLASS 1.0 protocol. GLASS 2.0 protocol uh, has been recently released. We have not yet integrated that into our report. Adam, let's make a note and let's get around to that eventually. Um, this especially becomes important when people start submitting to GLASS. In this database, oh, actually, um, it looks like it's partially there, blood, pharyngeal. So it looks like we have partially implemented it. Blood, lower respiratory. Oh, Acinetobacter. So actually, if I understand correctly, Adam, I think we implemented it for the tables, but we didn't change it for this description. So I think this table we need to update. So that's excellent. Thank you. Okay. We, we see the, uh, table 14 are the different specimen types. So, so yes, we have implemented the GLASS 2.0 protocol, but we have not updated the table here that you see. And then uh, the, and the organism distribution by specimen type. And then here you see the antibiotic statistics.
for lower respiratory for Haemophilus and E. coli for urine, we do require at least 20 isolates. Otherwise, we remove it. Um, that's why you do not see the other organisms. Uh, generally, people use at least 30. I'd like to use at least 20 because if it's 29 isolates, it's still useful to know. And then you can decide you know, where you want the threshold. So there were 24 Haemophilus. Those are the WHO glass AMR uh, statistics. There are also uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. There are sustainable development goals around smoking and diabetes and education and safe water and hygiene. And there are some new sustainable development goal indicators related to antibiotic resistance. One is about MRSA in blood. One is about ESBL producers or cephalotaxime resistant strains in blood. And I am only analyzing one month of data here. And in this one month sample data set, there were either no results or there were just not 20 isolates. We require at least 20. That's why it says either no results or insufficient data. But keep in mind, this is only one month of data and there were not many Staph aureus in blood during that one month. Cluster detection. This again will be the subject of a future webinar. But in the, in this, um, in the report, we do a couple of quick cluster uh, detection algorithms. There are better ways to do it, but this is more proof of principle, highlighting that it works, motivate you to learn more about cluster detection. And here it found two potential clusters. One is with Carinibacterium species, also known as diphtheroids. This cluster started on January 25th, ended on January 25th. So it's a one day cluster involving seven people on that one day. On the other hand, the Klebsiella pneumonia was from January 28th until January 30th, it's three days, involving 10 people. 10 people in those three days. If for those of you who have a familiarity with p-value, the smaller the p-value, the more unusual it is. So the diphtheroids example is very statistically significant. And the, and the Klebsiella pneumonia is also statistically significant. The traditional threshold is P equals 0.05, um, but P is 0.05 is not, is not a magic number. P equals 0.06 for me would still be interesting. I'm not trying to publish this, I'm trying to save lives. So if the P is 0.06, I would still be interested in exploring it further. See that says now as a graph, you see the diphtheroids on the right, the Klebsiella on the left, the graph is not so interesting because the graph is by month. And as you saw, it would have been more interesting to see this by day. And that is possible to do in WHONET, but the report is by month. So the graph on the right, the diphtheroids, there were seven people on the same day. I don't think that's an outbreak. Diphtheroids is not commonly associated with outbreaks, but it is commonly associated with contamination and quality issues. So my guess is that those seven diphtheroids on the same day is a true cluster, but it is not a disease cluster. It is statistically significant for me, probably representing a contamination issue. One reason is because it's diphtheroids and diphtheroids do not usually cause outbreaks. The second reason is if you have a true outbreak, it's usually not seven people on the same day. You know, even if you have an outbreak of food poisoning, some people get sick Monday, some people get sick Tuesday, et cetera. So for those two reasons, I don't think this is an outbreak of disease. I think there's a quality issue. That is also important. You want to find out who collected the samples. How did they get contaminated? So this is more of a patient quality of care issue than a disease issue, in my view. We don't know, but further investigation, you would help to convince yourself. The Klebsiella pneumonia, on the other hand, was 10 people in three days. That's more suggestive of a true outbreak. We'll discuss this further in a future webinar about the WHONET cluster detection routines. You can also do it by resistance pattern. Here you see these are Staph aureus that are resistant to erythromycin alone. And there were four patients on the same day, January 22nd, there were four people on the same day resistant only to erythromycin. So we use the resistance profile in part as an epidemiological marker of, of clonality. We don't have the genotype, but we have the phenotype. So we have four people on the same day and in the rest of the month, we're not any. So this could be a quality issue, something strange on that one day, 
or it could be a true outbreak. And that's your job. WhoNet will say this is statistically unusual. It's your job to investigate it further. Uh, and it did not find any clusters for E. coli. Keep in mind, this is only one month of data. And here we see the gram positive antibiogram at the top, the gram negative antibiogram at the bottom. And we are only showing you organisms and antibiotics where there were at least 20 isolates. If it was one isolate, five isolates, eight isolates, I don't care, that's too small. The CLSI recommendation and the recommendation from others is to have at least 30, but I would just rather show you something so that you can make the decision. For example, there are only 24 Haemophilus influenza, 23 Klebsiella pneumonia. Keep in mind, this is only one month of data. If I had one year of data, I would have obviously a lot more data. For me, it depends on the organism. If I have 25 results for Salmonella, salmonella typhi, that's important. I want to include that in my antibiogram. If I have 25 isolates of Klebsiella ozanii, that's not so interesting. People do not make empiric therapy decisions based on an expectation that maybe they have Klebsiella ozanii. So if it's a priority species, I go down to 20. If it's not a priority species, you know, 30 is still reasonable. So I'm gonna exit out of the word report. So you can see, how did I do this? I went to exit, I went to data analysis, quick analysis. I went to number five, data files. I chose my one file or many files and I clicked on begin analysis. So that's so very quick and simple to do, but I got so much information very, very quickly. I'm gonna do the same for quality, but I'm not gonna discuss it very much because I'm looking at the time. We still have time, but I'm not gonna discuss this particular outbreak, this particular document in great detail. It finished the analyses. It is now preparing the Word document. It's a much smaller document. Finally, is quality control alerts about possible mistakes. WhoNet will not say this is a mistake. WhoNet will say this is infrequent, this is unlikely. Please double check. The file now exists. Do you want to open it? Yes, I do. As before, the file is open, but I can't see it. I, here it is. I can choose it here. So now this is the epidemia. This is the quality report and the sections, data volume, quality control, like ATCC results, organism results, antibiotic results. I'm, I'll just show a little bit of this. Um, some of it's the same. Percent completeness. Age is... Uh, in our database that we give to you, everything is 100% complete. So these are the core, most interesting fields. So we are providing metrics for completeness of testing. So we'd like to use this as a metric for improvement and benchmarking. For example, many times the gender is 50% complete or the age 80% complete. So this can help you to motivate you to make improvements. For example, maybe most laboratories, it's 90% complete but one of the laboratories is 30% complete, so you can target your feedback. This particular database had no ATCC results. Going down further, this look at the ability to speciate. For example, they had 35 Klebsiellas. Every one of them, they knew the species, but the Enterococcus, they did not know the species except for once. Enterococcus, they simply called Enterococcus species most of the time, and once they called it Pecalis or Fecium. Pseudomonas they, had, Pseudomonas, they had 38 times and 37 times they knew which species it was. So that's a different kind of quality, the ability of the lab to determine species. Table four is about fastidious organisms. Can you grow a Haemophilus? Can you grow a Neisseria? There's a different kind of quality, not data quality, but laboratory capacity. Just skip down, skip down. These antibiotics have no breakpoints. I'm looking at table seven, invalid test. You should not be testing vancomycin by disc on Staph aureus. So we're looking for or antibiotics that do not have breakpoints. This is looking at regularity of testing, which we discussed earlier. This is the percentage by measurement, disc measurement, zone diameter, MIC value. So we encourage people to measure the results. Many people do not measure, they simply put R, I, and S. So this table tells me whether they're measuring or not measuring. 
And then here you see a list of priority alerts. For example, um, where's one example? You know, for example, Klebsiella is susceptible to ampicillin. It's possible, it does happen, but it doesn't happen often. So these are those are example of quality alerts. So I'm going to exit out of that. So I hope you see how valuable these predefined WHONET standard reports are. Limitation, you can change them. They are what they are for the time being, but they're very useful the way they are. The next thing I want to show you are the user defined reports. And currently we don't have one. And we still have 20 minutes, so we still have time. Now going back to my PowerPoint. User defined reports. So I'm in the same area, user defined, click on new report. You can create a weekly report, a monthly report, a pharmacy report. You choose the macros, you save the report, and then when you're done, you begin your analyses. As long as I'm here on the screen, I'm gonna to go to the next slide. Oh, okay, at present, user defined reports can be visualized on the screen or Excel. So those Excel screen reports I showed you, you can make, your, you can make those however you want. You have full control over those. WhoNet does not yet support user-defined word reports. We're doing it with Papua New Guinea in a rigid way, but we want to make this a flexible, configurable way so that you can make your own modifications in the future. As long as I'm on my PowerPoint, I'll just show you the DHIS2. So from WhoNet, you can export the results from WhoNet. You can import the results into DHIS2. You can see the data that you imported into DHIS2, and then you can visualize it in DHIS2 dashboards. For example, a map for confidentiality, I deleted the map so you can't see which one is which, which laboratory is which. So this is just to give you a little feeling about DHIS2, and this will be covered in a future workshop. Uh, the automation tool, I'll leave that for now. Let me go back to WhoNet. I am now in WhoNet, user defined. So how do I make a user defined report? Very simple, I click on new report. And let me call this, for example, my weekly lab report. And here on the left, you see all of the macros that you have created. This, These two I created today during the webinar. This one I created yesterday as I was exploring some things. So I want to do this macro, and then I want to do this macro, and then I want to do this macro, okay? And I can move that, I can, I, I can change my mind later. I can move that up, I can move it down. So you can control the content and the order. The possible macros appear on the left. The selected macros appear on the right. A report can include macros, of course. A report can also include other reports. For example, you might want to have a pharmacy report and a lab report and infection control report, but then you can combine them into one massive report called the hospital report. So normally a report only includes macros, but a report can also include other reports. So I'm going to do these three reports. I'm going to click on save. I click on save once. Here we have the weekly lab report. Save. It says, well, what do you want to call the report file? It's going to say weekly lab report.rpt. Save again. And exit. So now I have my weekly lab report. You can make a weekly report, a monthly report, a pharmacy report, etc. Now choose my same data file and I can export either to the screen or to Excel. Begin the analysis. It's now doing macro one, the Staph aureus, the E. coli, the Klebsiella, the Pseudomonas, the Werner salmonella, as we saw earlier. It is now doing macro two, the Staph aureus, the E. coli, the Klebsiella, the Pseudomonas, and the salmonella. Okay. It is now doing macro number three, which is outbreak detection. And in this example, you can see there's a possible cluster of Staph aureus. You see at the top, the organism is Staph aureus. Cardiology, resistant to penicillin and erythromycin. So not only do they have the same look, these are Staph aureus that are resistant to two drugs, penicillin and erythromycin. And they're all in cardiology. There were five people. January 18, January 19. So in a two day period, there were five people in cardiology resistant to these two drugs. In emergency room, there were three people on January 22nd resistant to the one drugs. 
This will be the subject of a future webinar, but just to give you a little idea about the possibilities for outbreak detection. I'm going to click on continue. So that's how, uh, so that's part one for the Steph Aureus. Um, oh, okay. The cluster detection is three parts. You just saw the detailed report. You're currently looking at the summary report, and you are now looking at the people. These are the five people in cardiology with penicillin and erythromycin resistance. If I go over to the right, you can also see the zone diameters to see how similar or different the zone diameters are. Here at the bottom, you see those three people with Staph aureus, two in blood, one in urine, resistant only to erythromycin. I'm going to click on continue because cluster detection is not the focus of this webinar. So that's how I make a macros. I simply click on new macro or edit macro. You have to create your macros first. So obviously, first you go to WhoNet Interactive Analysis, choose urine and blood and antibiogram and first per patient, the files, the laboratories you want, save each one of those as a macro. And then after you save it as a macro, you will see it here on the list. And then you can say what I'm doing doesn't make sense. I'm including the same macro multiple time, but you can control the content, which macros you want to include. Then you save it. I'm not going to save that. I'll click on exit, save changes. No. That's how you make and edit a user defined report. Let me go back to the PowerPoint. And the digits two week. Okay, that's all I have to say about the. Uh, I think we're doing good on. I do think we're doing well on that. I also do want to leave some. I'm going to talk briefly. Well, let's see. Um, I want to, there's a hidden feature. I want to cover this feature first, and this is the last slide. As you have seen, a macro usually only does a single thing. Percent RES for Staph aureus and E. coli, it does a single kind of analysis. But sometimes there's a need to run the same macro for many organisms or locations. So on the left is a normal macro that I am showing to you. One that I just showed on the screen, cluster detection for Staph aureus. So you see this macro only does Staph aureus. So I have shown you on this webinar how to make this kind of macro. But here on the right, with a very small change, you can see it's going to do Staph aureus and begin the analysis. And then Enterococcus faecalis and then begin the analysis. And then organism. So each time it's going to do a different organism. So by simply putting begin analysis, you can do have you can have this one macro do many things. Look for outbreaks in Staph aureus first and then Enterococcus, and then E. coli. So for many of you who have used macros before, this feature does not appear on the user interface. It's a very valuable feature, but it is not visible on the screen. So begin analysis is very valuable. And then you can, so that's what we do at our hospital in the middle of the night. We have it look for outbreaks separately for each of our different priority species. And then in the morning, we have an Excel file and the staff will be on one sheet, the E. coli will be on a different sheet. So I wanted to show that feature. And that leaves us time to talk about the WhoNet automation tool and then questions. And so the WhoNet automation tool can bring the possibility of doing automated daily, weekly, and monthly reports. These could be epidemiology reports, clinical reports, qual uh, for important isolates like Neisseria meningitis, possible outbreaks, possible contamination issues. And you can also look for quality issues like vancomycin resistant staphylococcus, Klebsiella sensitive to, ampic to ampicillin. So here on the left is what the software looks like. And we are in the process of, we, we made this tool for our uses here in Boston. Many other groups around the world have found it very useful, but it has a lot of features that you don't need. So we're in the process of improving the user interface. On the right, you can also set up these monitors to say, well, the normal range is in that green area in the middle, and it can go up a little bit or down a little bit. This particular graph, it says runtime in milliseconds. So look how fast the analysis is going. If it goes too fast, it might suggest that the data are missing. If it goes too slow, it might suggest a different problem. So you can monitor different kinds of alerts like that. So let me show the automation tool. I will now leave Hunet. We made this for my hospital. 
with a lot of steps that you don't need. Number one, copy input. Clean the data, run backlink, monitor the row count. Uh, I, I hope you see I'm changing the head. I'm, I'm clicking on the top. I'm not using my mouse, which is why you don't see the mouse. Number one, number two, number three, backlink. Or monitor the row count. We have a project with the CDC with 80 US hospitals. So after we run the analyses, we split it into the 80 hospitals. And then for the, the, the organizers, we put it back together again so they can look at the network results. We have some intermediate files that they are interested in. Then we run Hunet. We can copy the output where they want. We can combine things together. We can back things up for permanent storage. We can email results to the laboratory staff and infection control for infectious disease issues. We can email the data manager if, for example, the data are missing. And we can monitor alerts, you know, such as those graphs. That's, so that's all I want to say about this now. We made this for our project with the CDC with 80 US hospitals for automated live daily outbreak detection. So a number of these features are not useful for everybody. So we're going to simplify this to basic, normal, simple, the, the normal features plus other. So the things that are specific for Boston, we won't delete them. We'll just put them off someplace that they are available to you, but not so visible on the screen. I'm going to cancel out of that. If you want to learn more about our work with Hunet and SatScan, I'm going to PubMed. And if I look for, let's see. If I look for Hunet, oops, no, I don't want that. If I look for Hunet, and oh, if I actually just look for Stelling, Stelling Resistance. My name is not a common name, so Stelling Resistance, 71, most of the, let me put Stelling Antimicrobial Resistance. So there are 57, most of these are me. And then if I look for the word outbreak, you see, well, let me not put outbreak, let me put SatScan, that's the software we use for outbreak detection. And you see these 10 articles about our work with outbreak detection. I'll just leave it at that. I'm now going to go back to uh, the webinar. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna turn on my camera. I do apologize for the lateness, but there was a lot to cover. So there's time for a couple of questions. Um, I will stay on after the hour, but I don't expect everyone to stay on for the full time. So uh, any questions? Uh, I, I guess, Adam, if they have any questions, they'd have to put into chat. Yeah, John, so could you could you check um, in the chat? There were a few questions earlier in the call, so um, a couple of them in Spanish. OK, the, yes, the web, and I see. OK, how can you explain how to insert dates? In order to check daily alerts uh, for this question, I don't have time to discuss it now. How do you insert dates, parameters and macros to detect daily alerts? So please write us an email and we can answer that by email and it will also be the subject of a separate webinar. Can I assume that macros and quick analysis work with the way antifungal? Yes, everything is exactly the same. Tuberculosis, etc. Hi, uh, oh, okay, and I think Adam, you've already answered that question. Does Hunet have a web-based version? We're working on it. We've made some excellent progress um, for data entry, and that will eventually also be the subject of um, the subject of a future webinar. We have a pilot version for web-based data entry. Um, so if you have 20 laboratories, we're working with one project with the American Society of Microbiology to look at pertussis, uh, Bordetella pertussis in Mexico and Brazil, eventually Latin America, small volume organism. It's very useful to have people manually enter the data into a web-based database. So we have that as a pilot software. Also, we have a project with WHO and gonorrhea where it would be interesting, again, low volume for people to manually enter the data from many different sites into a central database. Then, for example, the peripheral site can enter the clinical information about the patient, and then the central site can edit the same record and put the microbiology results. Uh, okay, about export. In the past, the data export leads to format errors when it exported to Excel. Um, yeah, and as Adam points out, please change that. Is it possible to change the alerts criteria? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, Adam, I didn't see any questions in Spanish. 
pull all the way to the top. Okay, thank you. Will the recording be available? Yes. Give a good morning. Will the record? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. I see the Spanish, and I guess that's it. En el análisis rápido, cuando se muestra por servicio que Colombia toma un servicio o localización sin servicio hay una forma de selección de la localización. So there's an issue of translations. Hunet has one field called location type, location, department. They're similar fields. And then we translate into other language. So in English, we have a field called localization, uh, called location. In Spanish, we translate that to ubicación, which is a very general word. In Hunet, we have department. In Spanish, that's servicio. For the quick analysis, we do not use servicio. We use ubicación and tipo de localización. So that's, uh, and because it's a Hunet predefined, you cannot change that. You can create a user defined report. So Hunet is doing the report with uh, location, not department. If you want department or servicio, you can create your own report to do that. Hola Maria, so Adam will add that later. Can I change the alerts? So the answer to that is yes. I'm going to share my screen again. Screen. Going back to Hunet. Hunet. And this will also be the subject of that same. We'll have a, we'll have a webinar on alerts. Those will include the cluster alerts for outbreaks as well as the microbiology alerts. So here I'm going to the WHO test laboratory. Modify laboratory. And here at the bottom, it says alerts. So here is the list of approximately 200 alerts. You're now looking at all the rules. These are the high priority rules, the low priority rules, important species rules. This included initially a lot of species important for humans. With FAO, we got a list, a comprehensive list of priority pathogens in the food and animal sector as well. There's important resistance rules such as anthrax would be an important species. Anthrax not susceptible to Cipro would be an important resistance. And the details of the rules are here. You cannot change the rules that we have given to you, but you can turn them on and off by clicking on active rule. There's an also option here called new. When I click on new, I can say, for example, you know, Proteus, Mirabilis, study. High priority. Organism would be Proteus mirabilis. All isolates. Alerts. This is going to be an important species alert. Okay. Messages. Call Dr. Smith. They are doing a clinical study of Proteus. Okay. Okay. Uh, you can also say blood only, imipenem resistant only. So yes, you can make your own user-defined alerts. You see that here. These are Hunet alerts that you can turn on and off, but you cannot edit uh, and user-defined. So yes, you can do that. My screen again. I don't see any other questions at the bottom. If you have questions, please let us know. Uh, also, we're always available by email, online sessions, individualized. Uh, we have our travel schedule as well. Let's leave this for a moment for, to see if there are any other questions, but we, we just finished quite on time and sorry we did not leave more time. I ran out of time for more questions and answers. I'm thinking that the topic of the next webinar, I think I would like to do multi-drug resistance because that is core to our outbreak detection work. It depends on us tracking infection control people, tracking isolates. When there's an outbreak of MRSA, not all of the MRSA are the same. Some are very sensitive MRSA, some are very resistant. So I think a good topic for the next webinar might be multi-drug resistance from a pharmacy perspective, from an outbreak detection perspective, from a public health advocacy reporting perspective. I see some nice comments. I see a lot of names on the right that I recognize. And I do see for Skylab. Yes, yeah, Skylab is widely used in uh, the Caribbean. And I also came across Skylab recently in Timor-Leste.